Okay, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Milton Vadoulis. Look, thank you for coming out on such a fresh night and having a listen to the history of our, our family, uh, Vadoulis Garden Centre, Vadoulis Nursery, how it first started. So I hope you find it interesting. Uh, I've sort of gone through what I know of the, what's happened over the years. I've got some facts and figures out of um, documents that we have and everything, so I think it will all be quite factual. Um, I've brought some slides along. Uh, they're on a 30 second um, rotation. They're in chronological order, but I'm not specifically speaking about any uh, particular slide. So they're just there to entertain you so you don't have to look at me all night. So I'm sure that will be good. All right. Uh, well, let's get started. Um, I guess everyone always asks me, you know, why did your family come out to Australia and what were they doing beforehand? Well, I guess my father is from an island in Greece called Lesbos. You may have heard of it. It's a, it's a very large agricultural island um, to the east of Athens. So he started there, uh, obviously, as a young boy in the war and everything, so it was very hard to make money. So he started off doing agriculture. He did horticultural training. He did grafting of fruit trees and things like that. But in the war times, I know he had to um, burn wood and make charcoal. That was one of his jobs. He was a charcoal maker, or whatever you call them. Um, he used to tell me stories about that. There's a real art to making charcoal, too. I thought he'd just light a big fire and uh, collect what's left, but it's not the case. And then he also was a tobacco um, seller. So I, I'm not actually sure if he grew the tobacco or he was just buying the tobacco, cutting it and selling it. And that's how he said to me, that's how his uh, smoking habit started, because he needed to taste what he was selling. So <laughs> that's his excuse anyway. Um, so obviously times were very tough in Greece in those days, and I sort of almost relate it to what's going on there now. It's very, very tough there at the moment. You wouldn't want to be living trying to make a, uh, you know, make ends meet there at the moment. So it's almost the same things happen. It's gone full circle. But you know, they heard stories of, um, you know, the wages that you would get here in Australia, and that it was amazing. And you know, work was plentiful. So they all thought, well, you know what? We're going to go out to Australia, and we'll be back in five or ten years. And they send money back to their families, obviously, so they could survive. So they made their way out here, and Dad was in his early 20s, as Mum was, and uh, came out to Australia from... Uh, and I'm amazed, you, know, you can't speak the language, you know, they, they couldn't speak English. They came out here uh, trying to make a, a living, so I think it's quite amazing just in that sense. And of course, in those days, you don't didn't jump on it a jumbo jet and come out here. You had to sit on a boat for uh, two or three months. So it was quite a big uh, thing to do. Anyway, they, um, I know my, they didn't come out together. My parents met out here in Australia and got married out here. But uh, um, I know Dad told the story of um, he was going to Melbourne with friends of his because he had other friends that had come out. So he was going to Melbourne, but he was that sick of sitting on the boat. When it stopped off in Adelaide, he said, right, I'm getting off here. So that's how they ended up in Adelaide. Um, so, look, um, both, as I say, they, my parents met out here, but they were both, their first jobs when they got out here was factory work. Um, so they both worked in different factories and mum tells the story of her in a textile factory doing sewing and, and stuff like that and dad was in um, um, other types of factories and you know it, it's the hardship they had to go through even in those factories because they were because they couldn't speak English you know people took advantage of them and uh, you know I, I remember one story that Dad used to tell is there was a, a very elderly gentleman 
not able to do so much work in the factory. And then the boss came around and said, oh, you know, the older gentleman made a mistake. He said, oh, who did this? And Dad sort of said, you know what, I'm going to cop the rap for this so the old man doesn't lose his job. So, um, so you know, there's all these sorts of stories. And Mum used to say she was working on the machines really fast. And then when the, the supervisors had come around, the girls would push her off the machines and go on the machines and pretend Mum wasn't working and, and stuff like that. So times were very tough in those sorts of days. Anyway, um, when they met then, they started living with an English couple called the Hunters, which um, stayed family friends all through the years. And I remember them visiting us all the time, so they really thought a lot of mum and dad. And then dad was fortunate enough to get a job at Lascox, which was his chosen sort of profession, you know, in the horticultural business out there at Lockleys. So he became one of their team leaders and growers and everything. And John Lascock, the owner of Lascox, was very fond of Dad and, you know, promoted him wherever he could. But at that time, uh, Dad also hired out a block of land, which is where the Adelaide Airport is now. And that's where the first lot of growing started. So he used to grow field-grown trees in the uh, block there and used to sell them on the weekends to make money. Now one of the stories Dad used to always tell us, in those days, so he used to grow citrus there, so in those days the cost of a lemon tree, for example, was three weeks wages. Mm. Now, so I don't know, what's the average wage today, $1,000 a week maybe? So you imagine paying $3,000 for a lemon tree, which you wouldn't do it, would you? So these days they're $50. So a lot, lots changed in those times. But so he, he, he worked very hard. He, Dad worked seven days a week all his life, pretty much. Um, and he was trying to make money. And of course he was trying to go back to his homeland. But of course when you got out here, you couldn't save enough money because the cost was so high. And then um, they had uh, my sister, Mary Anthony. She was the first born child. She was born while they were still in Adelaide. And so that's when they decided, well, we need to make a life out here. So um, after having the uh, block out at, uh, near the airport there, trying to save some money, they saved a, a couple of thousand pounds, I think, in those days, which was a lot of money. So they were looking for land to buy so they could start a business of their own. So the only place they could afford to buy anything with a couple of acres was out at Rosedale. So uh, that's where they headed. So they bought two acres or two or two and a half acres out at Rosedale. And uh, it was a little cottage there called Rose Cottage. It was a three-roomed cottage, a kitchen, a lounge and one bedroom. <laughs> So uh, out they went there and, and, and started a life out there. So it was one bedroom. Then I came along. Then my other sister came along. So the five of us used one bedroom until I was a teenager. So <laughs> it, was a, it was a very tight upbringing. <laughs> but um, look, Dad was a grower. That was his passion, growing plants. Okay. So when he went out at Rosedale, that's what he wanted to do. So he was doing field growing. So that means growing plants in the ground and then digging them out in winter and selling them. <coughs> so he was growing things like roses, fruit trees and ornamental trees. So he started that. And of course, when you're starting to grow stuff like that, you can't just grow it on spec. You go and get an order from nurseries. So he got a really big order from a prominent Adelaide nursery at the time. So he got the order, the order was signed off on. He said, yep, yeah, can you deliver that uh, next year, Parry? No problem, I'll see you in June. So June comes. So he's done a whole year's work with no income. Well, I think he did do income. He actually worked for some farmers, you know, moving hay and stuff like that. And actually a lot of the farmers at Rosedale were, were field farmers. So, you know, they were all laughing at him because they said, Parry, how can you make money on two acres? You know, they were broad-acre farmers. They couldn't see how you could make money in horticulture. 
but of course they just didn't know the business and of course you can uh, make money on smaller acreage. So June came along and Dad had dug all the trees out and we called them burlap them. So they were wrapped in hessian, all the, you know, so they were dug by hand. It was a massive job. I don't know how you would do it these days. Anyway, he had them all ready to deliver to this nursery. So he rang the person up. I won't say who it was because he's very famous. Um, and, um, and he said, oh, gee, Harry, I'm sorry, I've ordered all those trees elsewhere. So all of a sudden, my parents had, you know, a year's worth of stock and nowhere to sell it. So, so that's how really the uh, business started. They moved out to Rosedale in 1960. And uh, so, so they had all this stock they had to sell. And uh, so they put that in the Barossa Leader. You know, plants for sale, nursery for sale, and that's how the retail side of the business started. So, um, you know, the community was very good to us. The Barossa community was. You know, people were coming out and buying their plants from mum and dad, and uh, that's how it all started. But, of course, dad was a grower, okay? So when you're a grower, you don't grow a, a broad range of stuff. You know, you might grow fruit trees, roses, and something else. So when people are coming to your place, they want different things. You know, I want a, a Daphne. Oh, I don't grow Daphne's. So he had to start sourcing stuff. So I remember, and in fact, I remember as a very young kid sitting in Dad's uh, ute, and he'd be driving around all the nurseries in Adelaide, through the Adelaide Hills, you know, buying bits and pieces of plants and taking them back to Rosedale to have a selection of products that people wanted. So that's, uh, that's how things started out at Rosedale. And, um, you know, after some time, he started employing some locals. I remember the Dahlenbergs um, were employees of us, as well as Ross and um, Ross Benithan and, um, oh, what's his wife's name? Ross, Chris, uh, Chris Benithan worked for the Gawler Council. They were uh, employees of us for many, many years. Now, I remember doing work as a, a young kid out at Rosedale too, which I hated. So in those days, there was, there was no such thing as plastic pots. So I don't know where they sourced them. That we used to use paint tins, used paint tins, and they were the big four-gallon tins. So I guess they were, they were painted schools or whatever and all these excess tins. So I had the job of putting holes in the bottom of them. So I remember that and I, it was this hammer with a big sharp point on it and I had to put four holes in around the rim. So I remember, the, you know, a big truckload of these tins would come in and, you know, there's this little kid thinking, oh, this is going to take forever. And it did. So, you know, I remember doing things like that. But that's how the business has changed, you know, from a very primitive agricultural sort of way to something that is there now. <coughs> um, so I also remember as a young kid, uh, Dad was a field grower and he kept doing it years after year. And of course, the, the next few years, the people did take his trees because they remembered they'd ordered them from him. So the business got uh, bigger and bigger in that sense. And I remember we used to grow roses uh, in Rosedale, which is amazing. I think there's probably photos being up of that. Um, and our, the way you grow a rose, you, in those days, you used to get the briars, the briar stock. You used to cut them in lengths of about a foot long, take all the eyes out of them, except for the top eyes, and plant them in the ground. So I remember going in the car again and freezing cold weather. It was always done in the middle of winter. I didn't cut them, but they used to go out through the Barossa and out near the reservoirs there, where there's old briars growing on the side of the road. We used to cut all of those and bring them back inside and they'd go inside the kitchen. So I remember as a kid, you know, a pile of briars about this high and about three metres wide and mum and dad cut them in into all lengths, ready to plant out the next day. 
So, you know, very, very difficult, uh, harsh start. Um, but what, it, it slowly progressed. Uh, and then we had a gentleman, um, after some years, come out to Rosedale, and his name was Frank Lord. I don't know if any of you remember Frank. Frank Lord was the general manager of Woodroofs in Adelaide. And uh, he had retired and he really liked plants. So what he was doing and what was happening typically of in, in those years, and I'm talking early to mid-60s here, is everything was sold in the back of a van. You know, I remember the bread man coming, the, you know, the ice man, all of that sort of stuff. So that was the same thing with plants. And Mr. Lord uh, used to come and buy plants from Dad and take them in his van and go around selling them to all the country towns. You know, just going up to someone's door, do you want to buy some plants? Oh, yeah, I'll have some, you know. So that's what Mr. Lord used to do. And Dad could see Mr. Lord was, you know, getting quite elderly. And he thought, you know, we're stuck out here at Rosedale. It's really out in the middle of nowhere. It's no place to really grow a business properly. So that's when mum and dad started looking uh, further afield. And they, of course they looked towards Gawler. They thought that was a good future to have a look at. So they started having a look. And um, I can't remember his first name. Again, it was a Dahlenberg. He was, um, he was one of the local real estate agents. So he took mum and dad around uh, and showed them all the blocks of land that were available. And of course mum was very fussy. She didn't like any of them. And she, they drove past the race course and there was the uh, black uh, bit of land there from days. And she said, that's the one I want. So then he said, that's not for sale. <laughs> but I'll see what I can do. So the rest is history, really. So they ended up buying the block of land that we're on now. Um, and uh, paid four times its value in those days. So it wasn't cheap, but it was a, a very good decision in the end of the, the day. So, so Dad had spoken to Mr Lord because he was getting elderly and running around in a car carrying stuff. He said to Mr Lord, look, do you want to go into the uh, Gawler site and run it for me? Mr Lord said, yes, I'd love to do that. So, um, so that's when Gawler started. They moved to Gawler in 1968. Uh, the Gawler site was opened in conjunction with Rosedale. They were both running at the same time. And uh, I remember again as a kid sitting in, the, in Dad's ute and it was freezing. I remember it was freezing and I was just sitting there and he was talking to all the guys that were doing construction of the site. They were putting a gravel driveway in and they built some, a, a big shade house and a, a toilet block. That was the only infrastructure we had. And, and funnily enough, the toilet block is still there <laughs> after 40 odd years, or 50 years, sorry. So the toilet block still remains and the rest is all gone. So it started off with a gravel driveway. It was called a drive-in nursery, of all things, in those days. It was a little bit different. Um, but it was very innovative. Um, it was built right from the start to recycle water. So back in 1968, my father thought that we need to recycle water. So right back then, it was built to recycle water. Um, <coughs> so it was very simple. We had a caravan as an office. And, um, and again, I remember sleeping in that caravan some days because we couldn't get back to Rosedale. Freezing again, everything seemed to be freezing. <laughs> um, but really good times. And of course, um, it didn't take very long for that business to take off. And then the, um, you know, they closed down Rosedale because it was too difficult running two sites and it wasn't necessary. Uh, so again, we do did grow field uh, plants out at, Rose, uh, at Gawler. So things like roses and poplars were grown out there. But of course, when we got to Gawler, there was many other items that we sold. We sold pots and fertilisers and bags of soil and stuff like that. So 
I remember before uh, we had moved to Gawler uh, that uh, w what I assume was a storm ruined the shade house. And I remember Frank Lord ringing Dad, you better get down here. And we all jumped in the car and we had a, a, a combi at the time, just a combi ute. So there was only one bench seat and there's five of us. So we always used to sit in the front of the combi ute. <laughs> Can't do that these days, can you? <laughs> Um, so we went down there and all the shade cloth was shredded and, you know, Dad thought, oh, someone's vandalised it, but I'm sure it was a storm. So there was a bit of a setback there. So things progressed and progressed and um, Dad thought, well, you know what, we need to move to Gawler. So he needed to build a house but didn't have the money. He was still paying the block of land off because we paid four times the, its value. So it took many years to pay off. So he needed to build a house. So he thought, right, I'm going to go and grow 40,000 roses out the back. That'll, if I sell those, I'll be able to build a house. So it takes a whole year to grow 40,000 roses, so he grew 40,000 roses, and what happened? Couldn't sell one of them. Oh. It was just one of those years. So he dug them all up, put them in the heat and burnt them. Oh, no. <laughs> Isn't that bizarre? <coughs> In our industry, we have a saying, if you can't sell something one year, make sure you grow double the amount next year. <laughs> so anyway, that's one of the uh, setbacks we had. Um, I remember as a young teenager having to uh, go out in the field and use a rotary hoe between the rows. We had a rotary hoe that was just wide enough to get through the rows. Rotary hoe was bigger than I am, or than I was, sorry. So I'm, you know, taking this rotary hoe, making sure I didn't hit the trees. One of my jobs. The other thing was uh, budding the roses and uh, roses and stuff. Once you've budded roses for a living, you hate roses because <laughs> you have to bud roses in the middle of summer when it's 40 degrees. You're working this far off the ground and it's prickly. As a kid, I didn't like it. <laughs> I don't hate roses. Um, so anyway, so we'd been to Rosedales and Rose, uh, sorry, Gawler site now for a few years. 1968, as I said, we moved there. And then Dad was starting to get tired. He'd done a lot of years, seven days a week. And one of Dad's employees at the time is Kevin Eckert. And uh, I guess a few of you may know Kevin. Um, Kevin was one of our employees for many years <laughs> and Kevin expressed interest to take over the business. So in, I'll just get the date of this because I'll get it wrong here. So in 1974, Kevin took over the, uh, the running, or, he took over the business, he bought the business from Dad and Mum. So then Dad could uh, just relax a little bit more and just concentrate it on his field grain, which was his passion. So that went well for, I think Kevin was there for nearly four years, five, uh, four years I think. And, um, and then at that stage Kevin decided to move on and open his own garden centre, which he opened down uh, opposite uh, what is Monia Besser now, or was Monia Besser, whatever it's called now. So at that stage, that was in 1977, Kevin left. So Kevin took everything away, and closed, pretty much closed it down. It, it didn't end very well with, with Kevin and Dad. They had a bit of a, uh, a disagreement. Um, so the place was closing, and Dad, uh, you know, I was about to leave school, and Dad said, well, do you want to take over the business? I said, no way. <laughs> it wasn't my patron. I wanted to be an electronic engineer. I didn't, <laughs> you know, I didn't want to, you know, as a, as a young 16-year-old, you know, plant's the last thing on your mind. <laughs> anyway, so I got talked into it, obviously, and, um, and, uh, I, and uh, I, I took over in 1978. <coughs> so we, we started to rebuild the business, and uh, with lots of help from my mum and dad. I had to buy the business, by the way. It wasn't given to me. I had to buy it. So obviously they were guarantors, but, um, but, uh, but 
But I guess that was the right way to do it. And I thought, hang on, the business was closed down. How am I buying something that's not there? <laughs> anyway, um, so we started um, uh, started up the garden centre in, in February uh, 1978 is when I officially started. I was 16. <laughs> I was uh, still very green and really not not my passion, okay? But I thought to myself, you know what? I'll give it 10 years. I'll do 10 years. I'll still be young enough to do whatever I like after. Well, it didn't take very long to develop a passion. It really didn't. I remember, um, you know, and it was very hard. I, I think I worked seven days a week for about 15 years straight to get it up and running. So it was a long, hard slog for me too. And I remember looking at different plants, and it was funny, I actually knew quite a bit about plants that I didn't realise. You know, I, looked, I knew lots of names of plants that had automatically just, you know, learnt being around them with my parents, oh, it's a Daphne or whatever. So I was, I was surprised that I knew uh, a little bit. But what really got me is the eucalypts. We used to sell a lot and lot of eucalypts in the little tubes. And there was hundreds and hundreds of varieties. And they all looked the same to me. I couldn't tell one from the other. I thought it was quite bizarre. And you know, the other, everyone would say, oh yes, that's a eucalyptus camaldulensis and there's a fissifolia. And I'm thinking, oh my God, they look exactly the same. But so, what I found is I really developed a passion to learn about them then. And then every day I would learn two or three different plants, or four. And I would, especially the eucalypts, I'd go out and make sure I knew which one was which. So it didn't take long to develop that passion. So then I decided that I needed to study uh, about horticulture. So in those days there was very little area to learn about horticulture. You could learn agriculture but not horticulture. So the Botanic Gardens used to run um, a course that was only available to people that were in the industry. And I was lucky, you had to apply and they would only have a few, I think they had, you know, six, six uh, spots for people that weren't working at the Botanic Gardens. So I managed to get a, a, a spot in there. So it was a four year course and it was absolutely fantastic. Working with all the botanists at the Botanic Gardens and everything, it was a, certainly a, a great learning tool for me and I learnt a lot and I loved it. So I developed a love for something that I didn't know I loved. <laughs> and I still love it today. I've been there for 42 years and it still interests me every day I get a kick out of going to work. Anyway, so you know, it wasn't all fun and games as well. I remember we just started to get on our feet. And in ni November 1988, I think it was. Can anyone remember what happened in 98 in November? Hailstorm, that's right. It absolutely destroyed everything at the nursery. We had just got to the point where we had paid for all the stock, and built some infrastructure and what have you, and bang, it was all destroyed. That was a point where we thought, do we keep going with this? Because that was a lot of work. That was pretty much 10 years work down the drain. Mm. So we decided to go ahead with lots of support from friends and, and the community that came and helped us clean up because I remember standing there, uh, you could see the storm coming, you knew something bad was coming and then when it hit the uh, garden centre, it just pulverised everything. And I remember standing there in the, in the toilet block actually, I thought that's probably the safest place to be. So I remember standing in the toilet block, looking out the window, with my hands over my ears because it was so noisy, and just watching the, uh, the hail to shatter the glass houses, just disintegrate them, just disintegrate them. So anyway, that was very devastating, but we did start that again. And then after that storm, we didn't have any more glass houses. 
they were all poly houses. <coughs> so after that was all destroyed, we thought we better not have any more glass houses, so we had poly houses. And we built this new um, revolutionary uh, growing house called a right light, which was uh, a north facing um, um, <coughs> roof. So the roof was uh, sawtooth, so the light would come in the north and it would be shaded at the top. It was very good because it saved us going up, up on the roofs and we used to spray them with lime to keep the light out of them, they'd get too hot in summer. So we built that and of course when we built that, that was a time when fashions started to come into the nursery industry. You know, things like um, indoor plants were very hot property. And so we had this indoor house room which you had to have to sell all of that sort of stuff. So over the years, we developed and we grew. We added another showroom, another growing area. And what I guess I did was I was, you know, I had lots of fights with Dad actually. <laughs> he was a very good, kind man, don't get me wrong. They weren't that sort of fights. But I was sort of always trying to push the boundaries of everything. And Dad was sort of, no, that's how we've always done it. That's how we're going to do it. No, you're not going to build that. You're not tearing down that and building something else. We're going to stick with it. But I always won in the end, to his credit. <laughs> and um, so we, we did lots of things that were innovative in the industry. Um, we were lots, did lots of things that were first in the industry. I ended up in the 90s travelling a fair bit overseas to have a look what was going on in the rest of the world. You know, what were garden centres doing overseas. So I brought a lot of that back to Gora and, you know, that's how our business evolved. And as I said, Things started to change in the nursery industry. Fashion was something that we'd never heard of in the nursery business. Well, you have, what do you have in a garden? In an old garden, quarter acre block. You have a lawn out the front, row of roses, maybe a couple of trees, and out the back, some fruit trees, and a big lawn with the hills hoist. <laughs> Didn't you? <laughs> well, things started to change. What started to change? Blocks got smaller. Houses got bigger, less people living in houses. People were starting to become time poor because they had all these big houses they couldn't afford, so they had to work more. So they had less time to garden. So things changed. Then, of course, we had the drought in the early 2000s. What do you think that did to our business? Well, I can tell you, in the first 6 to 12 months of that drought, it was again, you know, guys, what are we going to do here? You know, do we pull the pin on this or do we keep going? And I guess we were lucky to keep going. We found some different avenues of different products and ranges to sell. That's when we went into outdoor furniture more. So we imported lots of outdoor furniture, lots of pots, went into giftware, uh, and of course concentrated on the cafe just to get you know, um, cash through the door. And of course eventually the drought ended, so everyone's plants were dead, so they wanted a new range of plants. So everyone was going towards succulents and low water plants, <coughs> native plants. But of course we had some bad um, experiences with native plants in the 70s, didn't we? No fault of uh, anyone's except lack of, we were ignorant, I think. We used to plant eucalypt, uh, sorry, Tasmanian blue gums in the front of front gardens. Tasmanian blue gums grow, you know, 30 metres, and we're putting them in the front yards. So we created problems by doing that. So I guess people were a little bit gun-shy of going for natives, which is a shame, but nowadays, of course, we've got, we're much wiser. We have gotten far more suitable plants for, for gardens. So then what else happens? It doesn't end there. <laughs> the internet. What happened to us with the internet? Well, most people think, well, did people buy more stuff through the internet? 
Well, no, not really, not in our category. But the internet, people spent time on the internet, so it made them time poor. They didn't have time to go out and go. So the internet had a really big effect. In fact, I wrote a paper on it a few years ago because the industry was saying, what's going on? What, why aren't people gardening? It was a paper I wrote on the internet and saying, well, people are just spending so much time on the internet, it's, it's taking their focus away from what they used to do in gardening. And of course, the drought did the same thing. When you stop doing something for a few years, you get into a different habit. So you need to train people back into the garden. So very interesting times in the nursery business. So I think over the, the years, you know, we can attribute our success to passion. We were passionate about our business and about the type of product we, we sold. And I know <clears throat> all the time, uh, my father and mother taught me, look, I've spoken mainly about my father, but with my mother, if my mother wasn't in that business, it would not be there today. She was a workhorse. She was a very, very smart woman and a very good worker. But they both instilled a couple of really good lessons to me. One was always sell the best quality. Always make the place look as good as you can and always be honest and truthful to the public. And that's something we've stuck by all these years and it, it's kept us going. So what's, what's the future of our business now? You know, we're in the, you know, nearly nine, uh, 2020. I can't believe that. Gee, 2020 we're nearly into. What's the f future of our business? Well, we are looking into the future, of course. We're about to open an e-store, and we hope that will be open by the end of the e-store, e-commerce, so selling things online. That should be open in the next uh, month or six weeks, we hope. So we're looking at things like that. And, of course, we're marketing the business in a different way. You know, we're on Facebook and Instagram, and that's how we find most people are, using, are finding us, and that's how we're getting information across. And of course, Brian mentioned uh, my TV show, Get Dirty with Milton. And uh, look, I was asked to do that about 10 years ago for Channel 44, and I thought, oh yeah, there's something I haven't done before, I'll give that a go, I might learn something. <laughs> well, yeah, that was a big learning curve as well. But of course, my reason for doing that, apart from learning something new and learning a new skill, was really to get information out to people. It's really important to get the right information. It's amazing, you know, I do talk about radio as well as you may know, the same questions keep coming up week after week after week. And I think, does no one ever listen to what we say? <laughs> Maybe they don't. But it's all about giving information out there. And that's what the TV program does. And I hope I present it in such a way that's nice and simple for people to, to, to understand. So, look, I've enjoyed the journey. It's been a long journey. It's been a hard journey. But, of course, I couldn't have done it without a fabulous team behind me. We have a fabulous group of people that have worked through us throughout the years, right back to the early days of Rosedale, and I'm fortunate enough to be young enough and old enough to have seen right from the beginning to right now, and I've seen the changes. And uh, it's been a wonderful journey, and we hope to keep going for many, many years. I've got a son and a daughter. My daughter's 19. She might not go in the business, she's going into filmmaking, so we'll see how that goes. My son is working in the business on Sundays, just to get petrol money, I think, at the moment. But anyway, um, so we'll see how it goes. But I've, hopefully I've still got a few years left in me. I'm really enjoying what I do, so it's not a chore to go to work. So, look... That's the history of uh, our business and Vidalis, uh, as I know it and as I remember it. So um, I guess I can take some questions. I also have, before you go, I can't leave here without a mini 
master class on plants. I've got two plants here to talk to you about. Do you want me to do that now? Right, okay. I'm doing it now. Okay, what's next? Main hair fern. All right, you're all master class experts already. Okay, this is one of the plants we get most asked about. I always kill these things, don't you? Who's got one growing? Oh, lots of you, you're all experts. Well, you are came to the right place. This is the goal of garden club, is it? <laughs> okay, there's two things that you need to know about growing, growing a maiden hair fern. And the most important thing is bright light. Bright light's the most important thing. Most people think, okay, I'll put it in a nice, dark, humid bathroom. Bum bow. <laughs> you put it in that, you're going to kill it within a month. Well, not a month, it won't last a month. It will die off for sure. So bright light is the most important thing. How many times have you seen these growing in the cracks outside? Why? Because it's moist and there's plenty of light. The two things a maiden hair fern needs, moisture and bright light. You give that, you're going to grow a maiden hair fern very, very easily. Alright? So all of you are going to remember that, aren't you? <laughs> yes. They don't take direct sun, okay? They'll take a little bit of direct sun, but inside they have to be bright light without coming in a window. For the sun comes in the window and is hitting a fern, it will burn it. Alright. That's number one. Number two. This is a philodendron and a heart-shaped philodendron. So I wanted to show my love to you all. So I brought a heart-shaped philodendron. One of the biggest things I was talking to you about is fashion of plants. And we've seen fashion change over the years, you know, from native plants to standard roses to succulents to cottage gardens. Indoor plants were fashionable when I first started in the 70s. And guess what they are now? Super hot. Super hot property. In fact, one thing I, I perhaps omitted to say is we were always growers. Always, you know, we always grew what we sold. We stopped growing plants at Gawler site in the mid 90s because it wasn't profitable. It was it was cheaper to buy from growers. See what happens these days? It's like a fruit and veg shop. You don't go to a grower and he grows your pineapples as well as your strawberries, <coughs> does he? So you buy your I buy my philodendrons from a philodendron grower. I buy my daphnis from a daphne grower. It's more economical. But last year we started growing plants at Vidulis again because you couldn't buy this stuff. It was so rare, so popular. The demand was so strong all around Australia and the demand is still there. <coughs> you know, we put some plants online and sell them only online. There's some plants that are this size here, philodendrons. One's called um, White Princess. People just auction them off. $250. <laughs> They're that much in demand. So we actually started growing plants again, which was really interesting. And of course, I'd grown them all before, so we had the growing houses out the back. It was very easy for us to start because I had the knowledge. So uh, we're growing plants again, so there you go. Anyway, that's what wasn't the story, uh, wasn't what the story was about. Um, indoor plants are super hot property, okay? What's the biggest killer of indoor plants? Being indoors. Being indoors. Overwatering. Everyone overwaters them. See, I brought this love plant in. Everyone loves them too much. I wish someone loved me that much. So that <laughs> no. Um, so I'm going to tell you how to keep your indoor plants alive. All right? You all listening? Yes. So how often do you water your indoor plants? Well, look, there are some variations. So it depends on the type of plant, the size of the pot, and the temperature of the room, and of course the season. You know, in summer, plants tend to need more watering. Okay, in winter, at this time of the year, I've got this plant at, at, in my house, and I do, and I always leave them in the plastic pots too, by the way. I always leave your plants in the plastic pots, they're much easier to water. So I'm going to take that 
out at this time of the year every two to three weeks to water it. Two to three weeks. What's the worst thing I could do is I could water it every day with a cup of water. I'm going to drown the plant. Okay? Plants need, the plant roots need oxygen to survive. So if you're keeping it moist and wet all the time, there's no oxygen in there. So the plant starts to wilt because the roots die. So if it wilts, you think it needs more water, so you put more water on it. <laughs> so you're making it worse. <clears throat> so every two to three weeks, I water that in the winter. And in summer, I'll do it every one to two weeks. So here's the trick. How do I water it? Do I water it with a cup? No. I get a bucket. I half fill it with water, I dunk it in there, I leave it in there for one or two hours, and sometimes I leave them overnight because I forget. I take it out of the bucket, I let it completely drain, then I put it back in my decorative pot. If you do that, you're going to have this plant for 40 years. Maybe longer. <laughs> it's that simple. Okay, so don't over water the indoor plants because it's a killer. <laughs> These are a fern. These need to be moist all the time. That's the difference, okay? <coughs> Ferns need to be moist all the time. All right, there's your master class. <laughs> Who wants a philodendron? <laughs> Who was the first one up? Jim? Jim. Jim. here, fern. <laughs> gentleman there. There you go. Now, is there any questions? Any questions about the history or... Uh, it could be a plant question, I guess. Although oh, that mate. is extra. Uh, you're going to use the mic. <laughs> I'm not getting out of here. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. <laughs> um, I'm, oh, no. I'm not going up there. <laughs> Milton, um, I'm just wondering. I have a problem with... I'm very uh, sporadic with watering a plant. I have a plant, it'll go and then it starts wilting. Yeah. So I water it and then it comes alive. I don't water it until it starts wilting again and I water it again. Is that doing it damage? No. Long, long as it doesn't go past the point of no return. So plants, plants will wilt and they're telling you they need water. So, and it varies on the plant. But most plants, if they're wilting and you haven't left them too long and you water them and they come back, there's nothing wrong with that. The only thing I would say to that is... <clears throat> Plants are growing in potting mix now. It's not soil. Okay? So when you uh, let that completely dry out, it's, the soil's hydrophobic. It repels water. So to wet it from the top is very difficult. It might work and the plant will sprout back. But if you, and that's why I'm saying if you dump that in a bucket of water, you're completely saturating the, the bark particles and everything that are around that soil mix. In a big pot, you can't do that. In a big pot, you know, if you're growing plants outside in pots, I would suggest you use a mixture of potting soil and garden soil. You use a mixture of about 20% garden soil and 70% potting mix. And that does lots of things. It keeps, you know, lots of soil bacteria in the in the plant as well, which is beneficial. <coughs> oh, Ian, bring the mic down, please. Diane's got a question. Milton, do you fertilise indoor plants? Yes. How often? So you, I feed them every second time I water them. Okay. All right, I'm going to give you another lesson. Very, very quick lesson. Is that all right, Brian? We've got time for got one quick lesson. Yep. <laughs> There's three ways to feed every plant. Liquid food, that means anything you dilute in a bucket of water. Pelletised fertilisers like dynamic lifters. It could be complete D or any of those. That's number two. And the third way to feed is a controlled release fertiliser which is things like osmocote and stuff like that. For most plants, the most efficient way to feed is a controlled release fertiliser because that will feed the plant for six to eight months. Every time you water it, it's going to feed it. That's perfect. 
I would recommend most people use that sort of method when you're dealing with pot plants. However, with indoor plants, it's be if you're watering the way I mentioned, if you put controlled release fertiliser on that and you put it in a bucket, floats off, doesn't it? So you're best off, to, after, your third, after you water your plants, you always feed any plant after you water it. Very quick science lesson. Why is that? Why is that? Does anyone know the answer to that? Because it goes through the soil. It goes through the soil. There's another reason. What happens? It stops burning, doesn't it? It does. It stops burning. Okay. What is fertiliser? It's a salt. What happens when you put salt next to water? Or, for this matter, a young fresh root which has water in it? Yes. Of course you have um, the water pen uh, taken out of the root into the salt which burns the root. So you never feed a dry plant. You always have to feed a wet plant. Okay? You always feed after you water. So after you've taken this out of the bucket, let it drain, then you mix up your liquid fertiliser and apply it. Every second time you water. Georgie. Milton, I enjoy getting dirty with Milton on television. Thank you. Oh. Um, <laughs> but, and I, I believe you did about six, four, four or five series, and it's been a while since you've done one. I, I, it's been a I year since I've filmed more. a new oh. episode, yeah. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. One year. One year, yeah. Oh. I did seven or... I'm not sure, seven years? Yeah. Seven years, I think. We did. And yeah, I I'm love, not sure now. I love the Remember. bloopers. But even if you saw the old ones, they'd still be reasonably current because... Yeah, yeah. The, you, you, the information plant. is the same. How to plant a lemon tree. Mm -hmm. How to prune a tr fruit tree. The information is the same. Yeah. But the bloopers are fun. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> They're all made up, you know that. <laughs> Questions? Yes, behind you. Who was behind you? Milton, I've got three um, citrus trees right in my garden. Yeah. They're all about 12, 13 years of, of age. Yeah. They're about a metre and a half away from each other. Two grow prolifically. My limes, I can't get enough of them. Mm -hmm. But I don't know what to do with them. That's why I bought them. I'm having a second crop of mandarins. Yeah. But my lemons are like golf balls and they have the, the same uh, solidity. <coughs> you can't bounce them in. So I'm on the floor, they just, they just go dead. Mm. What am I not doing? What does the, is the fruit rough? Okay, well, I've got one here to show you. Oh, okay. Yeah, let me have a look. <laughs> I think I know what's wrong, but I'll have a look at it first. This is a big one. No, he's not coming. Go on. <laughs> What's the lines? What's the spikes on that? No, that's a lemon. <laughs> yeah, that's a lemon. I reckon this is a lime. <laughs> yeah, that, I'd need to cut it open. Is it green inside? No, this one's green inside. <laughs> this is what's got. This, no, this would go alive and say it was alive. <laughs> yeah, do you know what variety was? No. As I said, they were there before I moved into the place. And there was a... That's green inside, is it? Yeah. They're really the worst. Yeah. See, limes don't normally look like that. No. They start off green and they stay green. They've started to go yellow. Mm. Yeah, yeah green limes go yellow eventually. Yeah, for sure. See, they're, they're basking here. The majority of them are green. What does the leaves look like on this? Mm. Yeah, not the same as this. Is it juicy? No. No juice? No juice at all. And it's never had juice? No. Rip it out. <laughs> <laughs> it's never going to be any good. No. no. Whatever's happened. I thought it was the rootstock, so, yeah. so the original tree had died and what they grafted it onto has taken over. Yeah, oh, that's perfect. I'm going to make a mess here, aren't I? No, you're right. No. It's not too 
talking about is a, a, a Chinese plant called Dracaena, okay, we call them bamboos just because that's what they look like, yeah. it's a Dracaena, Dracaena is a very tropical plant, it's what I would call a conservatory plant, so what happens here in winter, they are extremely hard to keep growing, so it, you might be lucky to carry it through a couple of years, but it's a plant that you're going to have to buy on a regular basis because you're gonna, just going to kill it. Yeah. It really needs really warm conditions for it to flourish. And our houses here are too cold in winter. Thank you. We've got time for another couple of questions. <coughs> Ready, set. Bruce, is that a scratch on the head? No, you're right. No. All right, good. Well, I hope you all enjoyed that. Oh, I hope you learned something. I've never done so much preparation for talking on the line. Milton that, was, <laughs> Milton, that was a memorable address, and it gives me great pleasure to ask Paul Barnett to extend a vote of thanks to you for all the work you've done. I think, I think we've all got a. Sorry, I think we've all got a memory of, of the Doulis Garden Nursery. Um, some of mine, are, I've always tried, we used to make a giggle with Parry. He used to say, we'd always wish we had a little garden home like him down in our garden in the corner somewhere <laughs> to keep it all green and, and lush and it was beautiful. And another part of the, the, the Doulis story that you didn't mention, but I think it's important that you've always been the go-to people. If any group or club or function was on and they needed to fluff it up with some good looks, you could always come to the Doulis Garden Nursery and he'd always be obliging and help out every group. We've all got memories of fond things like that he's done. As well as another side of it, the industry, where we've all had kids that have all, well I know a lot of kids that have gone through the Doulis Nursery have learnt their, their ideas on business and how to involve, how to get involved with the uh, with people, with uh, customers, and it's a real learning curve. It's been an important part of Gawler's uh, history, which is important, which is what we're all about. Mm -hmm. So on uh, behalf of the Gawler history team, I'd like to show our appreciation with a, a cool. little bunch of goodies. I'm oh, speaking of fire, of course. And I'd like the, the history team to show a vote of thanks to uh, Milton. Well done.